Hello and welcome to another episode of uh, Martech Conversations with Dorey and Praveen Shekhar. This is the part two of our conversation on competitive intelligence. And for those of you listening in and viewing in, um, I'm doing it from a very selfish reason to get um, 30 minutes with Dorey Todla and also to discuss about a particular topic as a series and individual. So today, Dorey uh, would like to talk more about uh, technology intelligence. So Dorei, my understanding of technology intelligence is a study of the landscape, what ecosystem we are in, how fast technology is moving and how quickly is uh, technology absorbed by companies, including my competitors. Is my understanding correct or is there any other definition there is? No, I, I think there are, um, that's, I mean, what you said is exactly the way to summarize it. Um, there is technology intelligence, there is competitive technology intelligence and stuff like that. Um, you know, looking at some of the literature, it says, is it at three levels? One is at a global level where the whole world is moving in a certain direction, right. like, you know, to mobile, to cloud, you know, now to, you know, to AI, that kind of stuff. And it's a global, you know, it's not very specific to any organization kind of thing. Then your particular industry adoption rate which may not be the same as the global one, you know, like, um, uh, you know, certain industries absorb certain technologies faster than certain other technologies. For example, retail will do prediction, uh, you know, predictive engines and those kinds of things much faster because they are, that will help them a lot in their business, like how much to stock, all that kind of, and they've been doing it in, you know, some rule based right. systems earlier and all that. So, and then there are very product specific and technology specific ones, uh, which are like a more, for this product, uh, does how does technology help and all this sort of stuff? So technology in intelligence is the act of gathering information, um, gathering data, for example, uh, and uh, converting it to information. The usual pyramid, you know, data information. I leave the wisdom out of it, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, insights, basically inferences that you draw from it, and the whole stuff. Is the yes. so data gathering and some amount of so technology can be used for getting technology intelligence. That's mm -hmm. not a big surprise. It's kind of a recursive thing, right? So right. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a huge community of uh, technology intelligence professionals, uh, and that role is kind of distributed in organizations. When I looked at the jobs and things like that, and sometimes mm -hmm. the technology intelligence role is uh, played in the product teams. Um, some member of the product team will say, "Hey, you know, who are all." Who are all there in this field? What is being done? What is the technology absorption rate? What technologies are being absorbed and that kind of stuff? Dore, um, just to just to interrupt, how it happens in my company and those I'm interacting with, whoever is the tech geek, it is given out to him saying, "Hey, you go do the analysis and and come yeah. back," which is not necessarily the right way. But that's an interlude. Back to you, Dore. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, <laughs> you know, that may be true in all the cases because I think um, people focus on big problems, right? And they right. and they also focus on immediate problems kind of stuff. So uh, the bigger the organization, the role has to be slightly different, but I think uh, what they call uh, the literacy, technology literacy is important at all levels in the organization. Because if some geek gets excited saying that, Praveen, I found this new way of you know, find, doing this survey in blah, and, uh, you know, and he'll say, really? You know, prove it to me, show me a prototype. That kind of thing, and how long will it take? You know, why not three days? And why not one week? And so, I think some amount of uh, literacy has to be there from top. So, you know, many of these cases, you go and educate the management, and not that right. they don't have the time. And so, you have to give them in a very small, hey, this is what is happening, and and the best way to kind of convince the management is is what your competitors are doing. You know, and if you don't do it. Okay, that is one method. Another is that, hey, this is what people are doing and that may disrupt our business. And, right. and those are all things that people listen to because, I mean, they have an intuitive feel that saying right. the old way of doing things is always going to change. You know, it's always going to be a new way. Sometimes the new way may take a while. Sometimes the new way, um, look at Microsoft. They ignored the internet for a long time to their own peril. And right. then all of a sudden, I think there are a couple of guys inside Microsoft, this is not Bill Gates, who wrote a note to Bill Gates saying that, hey, if we are not going to be in this, we are toast. 
and uh, for a long time you know same thing happened with under steve bomber about ignoring open source but look at satya now and is like embracing open source and right it, even big technology companies certain shifts in technology and the uses in digital equipment corporation the mini computer company i used to love and and i used to work for a sub, you know kind of subsidiary uh, dealer of that and um, they just they went they were bought by compaq which was like a tiny uh, pc clone company you know at, at the time these guys were like you know the kings of uh, my, you know mini computers they ignored a lot of trends right they ignored um, intel coming up they ignored pc operating system they, mm. the first version of pc dos was some something terrible uh, you know it's uh, they they you know like it's not even you know uh, they and uh, ken olson just put put this whole unix business and all that so <clears> i think even big companies technology companies uh, are are you know sometimes blindsided by their own conviction of what is currently going in the market and they, right. they don't see the um, uh, stuff in there but so i i have is, uh, yeah i i have a practical question here because yeah. new new things keep coming up in the technology landscape yeah. for example the latest one there's the buzz going around is clubhouse which okay. is an audio based engagement platform with a very unique and innovative marketing strategy uh, we had to beg for invit- invitations i got one invitation got in but uh, um how much of that to take in how much of it is hype how much is reality how many such new things should i as a marketer invest in or as an entrepreneur uh, invest a time and resources in the right that's yeah, a classic I, question yeah so th- this is basically the uh, you know the internet has enabled uh, in news to travel really really fast this club house would have taken probably like two or three years to penetrate and come up on your radar long time back right because right. of the nature of technology <laughs> the tiktoks of the world and the you know clubs of the world they just bring up like which ads and so our the the answer is uh, it's a, at this point in time i would watch uh, for the simple reason is that what does it really make does it affect my core business right in the case of marketing yes probably but has what is the equivalent of a clubhouse um, that is technologically one uh it's one generation behind what is it what do you think it is it's zoom call right yes it technically yes technically right in the, in the sense that clubhouse is audio yes and uh, you know and uh, of course there may be a lot of other kinds of things in there and zoom itself adoption rate is very slow and the only because of covid zoom <laughs> got up <laughs> yeah right shot up <laughs> but if you look at look at the collaborative uh you know learning systems they've been struggling for decades right and then then something one something happens that is an external event and the techno or the technology event either technology becomes see, so cheap so easy it's on the phones it's everywhere and all the kind of thing and it takes off or if it is um, some external event like hey you can't step out and go to office like usual what are you going to do now you better you know like imagine what would have been if the same covid hit us 20 20 years ago two decades ago before the internet <laughs> became what it became right? right the speeds were not there uh, imagine the amount of you know the gigabits the youtube was not there at the so video right. were, so that is uh, so the way i would look at the clubhouse or any other kind of thing is like who are the major ones adopting the technology and uh, this happened to me in 1998 i was looking at xml uh says and then um, when i was looking at xml i said uh you know i was in relational databases for two decades and uh, i said wow this is going to go but it but after some time it reaches a kind of so when once uh, jeffrey moore has this curve right you know technology adoption curve right, right. there are all these gaps and all that once the laggards also follow suit grudgingly so that technology is gone gone to a stabilization state yeah. right? and then suddenly this no sql came and then of course sql uh, came back to some extent in so basically what happens is the market drives the needs actually needs drive technology okay. and technology drives new needs and technology comes yeah. and then you know it creates new needs and create new possibilities for example and uh, uh, 
I'll tell you, my my stories are old, but. in 1991 uh, windows came out uh, early 90s windows came out 8991 kind of thing and it was uh, crappy you know it was like every time we resize the window all windows will resize it's like a tiled window stuff that microsoft adopted then by, i think it took almost like a couple of years before the windows 3 came in and that completely changed um, the way people moved from dos to windows when people moved from dos to windows there was a big problem the problem was there no applications on windows at that point in time right and i'll draw parallels to this in every generation of technology right and uh, people said a lot of people took advantage and there was this guy by name charles pretzel who wrote a like a 500 page book on how to write windows application it was a hot seller <laughs> and the first application saying hello world on windows was about something like about 70 lines of code it's c code it was a different style it's called event driven programming and this and that and all that kind of thing and then suddenly in, in 93 i think and i sorry 91 92 time frame visual basic came out mm. and visual basic it was one line of code to write a hello world application so i ran up to my partner and said hey we have to do something about it because we were in the beta at that time right. and then he said okay what do you want and the usual stuff and why should we do it we have this other product that is still not selling why don't we figure out I said no no this is an opportunity we should take and I said okay i said we should uh, i'll give you two interns go do a prototype so i did a prototype went back to him and then he said okay fine this is great now what are you going to do and i said i want to go to microsoft launch event I said what that is damn expensive like 7500 or something like that i said we all went to atlanta at that time and in windows um, vb was launched uh, and then we had a booth and all the others were all having vb all kinds of things and we had a database engine that we already developed connected to vb and every microsoft product manager was at our booth saying this is cool this is the first application you are like there is nobody like this in the, among the 19 vendors who were there in the room right he said when can we get it i said okay, it's not ready this is what i'm showing you he said doesn't matter so we give don't have documentation me. doesn't matter whatever you have you give it to us give us a right to copy it we'll give it they gave it to the sales force 100000 people that that went around and took it. and then they bought a, about 1500 copies and they said the only thing is you go print the manual here is your money <laughs> uh, but just make sure it's the same size as the vb manual and right. put an elastic band and all of a sudden within a couple of iterations of that uh you know third product in that series uh we did like 3 million dollars in one year start mm. and we marketing spend was less than 100000 dollars we just used to show up to this in this show shows with booth <laughs> Microsoft guys used to come, and every time I gave a demo, a bunch of people came with me and said, "Yeah, we want this product." And they said, "We don't. We're not ready." They said, "We don't care. Give it to us," because people are rapidly building. So sometimes what happens is just by these these gaps, you know, wherever a new tool or new technology is introduced, uh, it creates a gap, right? And it creates a gap, and and a bunch of innovator outliers think of new ways of using it. Happened with WhatsApp. happened with facebook and for a long time people couldn't figure out and suddenly people figured out facebook is a great advertising platform which is right. an alternative to google for example it takes sometimes <clears throat> it takes time to sink in but if you watch the outliers so if you are if you are one of those early adopters okay or innovators you know these are the first right. two people right. in the jeffrey moors uh, you would watch the technology and you'll you'll just see who is adopting it and uh, and the corporation will come later they because you know the banks and all these guys will say hey it has to be stable it has to be secure they can you know mess around with uh, technologies but are they doing pilots you know who are attending these conferences who are the speakers in these conferences who are on the standards bodies who are you know the big licenses kind of thing and when you start watching them for a business one you know i'm right. it's not an answer to your clubhouse question the i am struggling with it also <laughs> no no but you know mm-hmm. when our conversation is that we started with influencers moved mm-hmm. into uh, which were individuals to associations to the landscape in yeah. terms of watching end of the day it comes down to this information so carry yeah. on the way lovely yeah so what what happens is um, you keep an eye on technology so that i mean lot, there are a lot of these are like great story but there are also like 
not a, Microsoft had this thing called OLE 2.0. I mean, the entire industry, there is also another 500 page book for that completely unreadable. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the huge industry money was spent on it. A lot of things, you know, it just uh-huh. didn't turn up to be anything. You know? Similarly, there are a couple of other products that Microsoft had, they all went completely, you know, zeroed out by the advent of internet. Uh, and you know we know about Wikipedia versus Encyclopedia right. and all this kind of stuff. So, but if, let us look at it from a business point of view. Uh, the thing is, you look at the technology, and then when you look at the technology, can you think of different ways of using it? And the way mm-hmm. I would use it is, um, you know, does it take some amount of my work and automate it for me? That way, removing the tedium, you know, like or making it qualitatively better, need not necessarily right. cost, right. cost ways better, right? <clears throat> the second thing is, does it save me money, you know, which is a, it's a big debate, you know, humans versus machines kind mm-hmm. of thing, but we'll come to that, you know, does it make humans operate more efficiently, you know, with the help of technology? So does it augment my, uh, you know, my team, you know, productivity of this kind of stuff? And so that is one. Does it change something fundamentally? That you, does it right. enable something that was never possible before? Like in the case of internet, eBay mm-hmm. wouldn't have been a company at all without internet. Right. Amazon couldn't have been born without internet. <laughs> Amazon couldn't have built a better book house and, right. any, and competed with Barnes and Noble or any of the biggies at that point in time. And they said like uh, the initial Amazon advertisements, if you saw, uh, in mid 90s and late 90s, they were saying that, you know, they'll talk about these huge ships carrying books and said that much of books we have <laughs> at the tip of your finger. I mean, like they had this variation of this uh, thousand songs in your pocket thing of Steve Jobs in, you know, right. and they were, at the time they were just a uh, bookseller, but it wouldn't take a lot of time for people to say that if you can they sell their books, what are all the other things you can sell the same way that you sell books? Not the same same customers, okay? Can you sell cameras? Can you sell uh, you know gadgets? Can you sell um, you know uh, things that you can recommend to others? You know based mm-hmm. on their purchases, uh, you know can you sell clothes? For a long time, clothes were no no. Everybody had to go touch, feel them, wear yeah, them. Yeah. Then only this. It, it took a long time. But all those companies that started with, you know, automating um, selling clothes, they had, you know, very small markets. Like right. you know, there is a company in India called Eshakti that was doing it, and they finally went to uh, mid east market because, you know, people said, "I have to go touch it. I want to feel it." And, but now today, you buy in Amazon shoes, clothes, shoes, yeah. Zappos, for example. Yeah. You know, um, so there, I think you start thinking about what are the adjacencies, but what is it? How can you take this technology and right. you know, do that? And then the Uberization of various things, right? You know, like we talk about, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have this um, particular, uh, you know, how can I disrupt this business? Right? And it's also, be, you know, I don't know the original Uber story, but Airbnb story is that, you know, hotels were too expensive. And too impersonal, and they're pushing, you know, whenever things are bundled and they're pushing right. the, cost. the same argument like CD, where you had to buy 14 songs to listen to one song, versus selling by song, which is basically, you know, digital music, MP4. Yeah. But a lot of things have to, MP4 had, MP3 in this particular case had to happen. Digitization of music had to happen, and the quality had to be good before this technology could come into place. So what right. you do is you generally watch the marketplace, but you pay attention to things that can directly affect your business uh, or that, that can impact your business in some positive way or negative way in the sense that if I don't do it, you know, somebody else is doing it, you know. Right. And, and even here, we have the standard curve of early adopters and then the core and then the laggard story. We are talking about the unknown here and it is pretty much a gamble as an entrepreneur. I mean, today it's Clubhouse and we're still trying to figure out what it is. It could be something else tomorrow. One is, of course, where all do I invest? And the second, of course, is the hesitation that comes along 
as to well which horse do i bet on and if it's the wrong horse then i'm already behind yeah uh, no i think uh, you take small bets um, you know actually there's a book called small bets all right <laughs> yeah. yeah so there is a the the interesting idea is that no you don't uh, bet on it immediately you watch right you watch for the third second or third generation of that technology um the signal has been around forever yes. forever it was geeks tool and oh, geeks okay <laughs> yeah it is long long in fact signals core uh, protocols infrastructure is what is used by whatsapp and others kind of thing whatsapp because of this you know le- recent license you know funny thing that uh, facebook did people are switching to an older technology in droves okay so it's not as with the technology but they never became popular whatsapp has obviously had a much simpler user interface and all that but whatsapp took a long time to become a business tool uh, but i i was talking to this um, a friend of mine uh, has the real, uh, he's in the realty industry and he says you know what is my biggest problem all my realtors talk to their customers and whatsapp them in their personal phones and i don't have any sales data or customer right, data right. or anything right. in there so a business whatsapp would have been you know like very very different you know production curve and they should have opened up the api they should have given it they make made it so hard we know that right you know how difficult it is you have to go through somebody yes thing. yes But why did it take so much of time it's not as a technology kind of stuff and it's a, there must be something else that is holding it up and it would have become natural once businesses adopted it they don't switch you know they they take a long time to switch so right. i'm i'm going to throw a completely different question um, to you dorai because i know you have the answer mm-hmm. how big is this market and how do we figure out this technology intelligence market is it really big is it important um you didn't mention you had some statistics to share yeah so the technology market intelligence that itself is like a function in a company right so it is as big as the businesses see let, let's think about it like every business has an it spend and the it spend varies now yes. the it spend is increasing like um, you know about almost 4 5 years ago uh, suresh samandam from orenscape told me that hey we don't have computer servers anymore in the com- in the office right. we all subscribe to the cloud i mean they are like one of the early cloud companies in chennai right they used to do right ones cloud anywhere kind of thing and they were on so they are like the biggest experts in cloud he was saying that they all he gave wifi laptops and everything is on cloud and people can just walk in and do it completely change the infrastructure of the uh, company you know, for uh, for doing it kind of thing right so depending on company they use technology a lot the it spend is much is a different ratio in some cases technology is very small then you know it's only for payroll ledgers and inventory and supply chain management and all that kind of thing so if you take part of the it spend you know what is how much money do people spend on marketing you know mm-hmm. uh, what is the percentage spend uh, number you have you know i have one and i just want since you are the marketing expert i want to put you on the line here <laughs> what do you think is the average spend in, on marketing if it is a startup to growth stage an easy 30 40% and as it goes a bigger it's a mix between marketing and sale of 12 to 20% mandatory and then okay. it slowly comes down as the company increases but if it's going to be fully on growth where the focus is more on top line the right then 20 25% is absolutely normal that's fantastic because the last time i mean i think steadily grown companies in this must have been older figure the record is 8 to 12% kind of stuff is the num- number that i heard but you're right in the beginning you do need to spend a lot of money on marketing yeah. in fact if you take a startup if there are two major functions one is to produce another is to market and sell yeah. right? we again came back to the marcel business right <laughs> so so you somebody has to go and describe it to the customers and you know sell it and mm. then we have this uh, you know people who produce it maintain it improve the quality and that kind of thing this is the two major teams right you know others yes. are are all like support functions but these two are core functions to the company you know um, and the way you do it is slightly different in each one of the cases so um, so you take the it spend and you take the marketing spend um, 
and then you see, see the strategy you know how you know how much where does it fit in is it is it part of it marketing and part of it you know because the it part of any technology adoption is not the major expense right it is the training of the people changing the mindset adopting it smoothly so that existing operations continue and all that sort of stuff but what so what almost all many of the companies do is they small start small pilot groups right. they take one uh, non trivial but non critical uh, right. area of the company and then go and say okay what i am going to do and you know where i am going with this uh, micro products right you go build a micro product and then you the you know my favorite example again is hubspot's website grader yes. it's a lead website grader is just a way for them to assess how many people are interested in improving their websites and that's a market yeah. right and uh, they give it away free you know almost 5 6 years ago it was more than 5 million users yeah. and um, it acts as a lead gen so they'll say okay if you run your website we'll send you this report give me the email address mm-hmm. got the email address and then they gave the report and said do you want us to improve it we'll do this kind of things got more details you know incrementally right lead generation mechanism for them and uh, so would you have thought of some tool that analyzes the website and gives you some stats as a tool for lead generation uh, right. for a company for example and so it's so it's not even just the technology it's actually what the technology enables for your company i think that is basically what what we need to look at beautiful and i think that wraps up this episode in terms of technology intelligence Yeah. there's quite a lot uh, that all of us have learned and a few things that i'm taking back to my company the right is to go and check what is the tech literacy in my company top to bottom how literate are there in the technology that is available and then to look for adjacencies in my market of uh, research analytics and consulting um and then of course uh, look at the small bets that we would need to continuously place yeah. specific to um, the technology intelligence oh Lovely, Dorai. That wraps up today's episode. Thanks a lot for sharing your Thank gyan you. with us. Thank you, Pravin. This is a pretty interesting topic for me. It is. So if you get me ex- talking, I'll never stop. So. <laughs> you know. Lovely. Looking forward to the next episode. Okay. Thank you. Same here.